Hey everyone, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. First, I want to wish you all a very, very happy new year. Today's case, we are going to be talking about Melanie Ray Summer. She was 49 years old at the time of her disappearance, which was in October of 1999. There are very limited details available on this case if you look online. However, someone got in touch with me that happened to be with her during this time right before she disappeared and told me the full story so i wanted to share it with you all i will be reading this person's story verbatim their testimony they asked to use a pseudonym so we will be calling her gwen at the time gwen was living in a very old cabin in the middle of nowhere in koke state park on the island of Kauai. Hawaii. She was living 14 miles off the main highway, then another mile and a half down a road that only 4x4 vehicles could go. Before I talk more about that, I want to show you a picture of Melanie and I want to tell you what we do know about her, at least from what she told people. This is one of the only pictures we have of Melanie. She was 49 years old with brown hair and brown eyes. She said that she was a yoga instructor. Apparently she had just recently moved to the islands because she was in an abusive relationship. She was living in the state of California. She had been married for some time. It is unknown whether she left with his knowledge or not. However, she traveled to the state of Hawaii. She eventually met a man. He was working as a chiropractor. She offered to do some work around the house. She eventually moved in with him. We don't really know the specifics from what she told Gwen. They had some sort of falling out. She had left just very recently in the October of 1999 and she wanted to go off and go camping and hiking. Gwen was living a few miles down the road from Mount Wai Ali Ali, which is considered to be one of the wettest spots on earth. It gets in a tremendous amount of rainfall. These are all pictures in and around the area. And now I'm going to tell you in her words what happened. Gwen's fiance lived another two miles away from her, again down another 4x4 road. He had a next door neighbor named Pat. She was an older woman in her 70s who lived alone, but had two very successful businesses in the nearby town. Gwen was at work one day and her boyfriend Bill called her and said something weird happened. Her, Pat, the neighbor, the woman that with the businesses called him to say some strange woman just drove her car into her backyard and she's knocking on the back of my house and I'm scared. Pat told Bill that she was so scared she held the woman at gunpoint until Bill came over. Bill said he then he came over. He guided the woman, Melanie, to his cabin. Melanie said someone told her that she could just drive her car up to Coquet State Park, choose any one of the side roads and just park there and camp anywhere she wanted. Well, these were only half trues. There are campgrounds, yes, but permits are actually required along with appropriate vehicles, which she did not have. The road conditions can be extreme in these areas. Bill, being the nice guy that he was, knew that this woman would need to spend the night until the next day when he could figure out how to get her car out of its predicament, which was stuck in the mud behind Pat's house. Bill then asked Gwen to stay at his cabin that night because he didn't want to be alone with a stranger, which she found cute because she said, quote unquote, girls are usually afraid to be alone with strangers. So she stopped by on her way home from work at his cabin that night. Bill had shown Melanie to the spare bedroom. She was helping going through her belongings, rearranging some things. And one thing that took Gwen by surprise, she saw the biggest Ziploc bag she ever seen in her life filled bursting at the seam with at least two to three dozen prescription bottles. Gwen said that based on her brief chat with her, she seemed healthy. She didn't look like she had any illnesses. She said she was a yoga teacher. Her story was, like we already discussed, that she had moved from California because of this abusive husband. Bill and Pat's road was actually the first side road that Melanie had ventured down. Melanie somehow managed to drive all the way through Pat's front yard, negotiating this super narrow tight turn around the side of Pat's cabin and then into Pat's tiny near non-existent backyard. Here are some satellite pictures to give you a better idea. According to Gwen, she did all this in a full-size 1980 
model Chevy Impala, this big old car. The next morning, she went out to her car, which was parked in Bill's front yard. She felt that the engine was hot and her makeup was scattered all over the front seat and floor. Melanie came out immediately and started apologizing, saying that she had borrowed the car because the keys were in it and she said that they were still asleep. She didn't want to wake them, so she wanted to go out and scout the area to look for places to camp. Gwen stated that she wasn't mad, but she thought this was a very weird thing for a stranger to do. She's quoted in saying that even friends and relatives ask first before they can take your car. For a stranger to just take your car for a while and bring it back slightly trashed was a little odd, but they were still nice to her. Melanie asked her about the hiking areas around Bill's and Pat's cabins. Gwen explained that behind and not too far in the distance was a scout camp. She thought this was a good and safe recommendation for Melanie because it was not often used. She knew it had bathrooms, sometimes running water or showers. She explained a few other trails that are near this camp. Based on what Melanie had told her, Gwen figured that she just wanted to go on a day hike, possibly an overnight. That's why she recommended these trails. Gwen had to leave for work roughly at 11 a.m. that morning. Bill talked to Melanie and agreed to try and help her get her vehicle out of Pat's yard. He tried starting the engine, but of course the engine wouldn't even turn on. Bill said that Melanie was sorting through her things, not really paying attention while he was trying to figure this out. He realized that in order to get this vehicle out, they were going to have to basically cut this massive path through this very, very dense thicket made up of these very tough vines and various saplings. Melanie eventually walked back over to Bill and asked what was going on. He explained that her car wouldn't start. It would take them roughly two to three days to build this path where he could get the vehicle down to his Jeep, where then he would try and jumpstart it. After receiving the news, Melanie really just didn't do much. She just went back through her car, was sorting through her belongings, and Bill said he was gonna go back to his cabin and make some lunch. Bill was expecting to see Melanie within the next 20 minutes, however, she never came back. So he went back to the vehicle, he figured she was still there going through her belongings, but she was nowhere to be found. He also knew Pat, the neighbor, where the car was stuck, had already left for work, so she wasn't there. He didn't know what to think. After Gwen got off from work that night, she stopped over at Bill's to check on Melanie, and that's when Bill told her. Bill said that she never showed up for lunch and she left her suitcase with all her clothes in the spare bedroom and it looks like she only took her backpack. Bill and Gwen discussed this for a while and they thought of two possible scenarios. Because she only took her backpack with all of her medications and didn't return by dark, they thought that she probably had either walked down to the main road and hitchhiked in order to get off the mountain and possibly go to another camping ground area, or they also thought that she may have tried to go to one of the places that they had suggested to her. At first, they weren't concerned because they had met many people over the years that had come to visit Hawaii, specifically this park. Gwen said they made these assumptions because of the type of people that they were so used to encountering in the park. Often they were tourists who would get their silly rental cars stuck on our muddy roads, she said, or they were tourists themselves that had started a hike, went out hiking, got exhausted, lost, or disoriented due to many hidden or missing signs, or they were just simply out of shape. The other type she said they often ran into were the hippie or free-spirited, as her father would call them, sandal-wearing hikers who would just want to go for a free hike, purpose trying to enjoy the beauty but really having no idea where where they were going usually smoking weed she said though that in all their years of all the hikers that they encountered of this kind they were always able to help these people were always usually very friendly and were able to make it out of the park safe they were very concerned that Melanie had all those medications but they thought that Maybe she just had a chronic illness. They just really didn't know what to think. Gwen said that they were all at roughly around 4,000 feet in elevation. And during this point of the year, she said that during the afternoon, late hours, there was always a very heavy mist of thick clouds, which made driving and hiking very dangerous. So they definitely were worried, but they thought Melanie would definitely come back because all her stuff was there. Plus, she knew she wanted to get her car out. So for the next week or so, they just went about their 
daily routines, figuring that Melanie would show back up on their doorstep with some friends that she met out on the trails or camping. This never happened, and eventually one day Pat came to Bill and said, do you know when Melanie's coming back to get her car? And he said he had not seen her since the day the car got stuck and that she didn't come back for lunch. He didn't know. Pat suggested that he take the suitcase down to the police department and file a short report. Bill did exactly that. He packed up her belongings, took it down to the police station. When he got there to file his report, he found out from the officer that someone had already reported Melanie missing. They didn't know who. They thought it was probably the chiropractor she had been staying with, but the police officer didn't tell him. This is when the official search actually got started for Melanie. Unfortunately, at this time, several weeks had passed, but they did get a search going. They had helicopters, people on the ground. It was listed in the media. I'll have one article that was posted in their local paper on the island of Kauai. The initial search started on Bill and Pat's property and then spread out. It spread to the locations where Melanie had suggested some camping and hiking spots. At first, they found nothing. Then a man named Frank, who was one of the park rangers heading up the investigation, said they found a Kelly green jacket with white stripes going down both arms. The park ranger brought it to the cabin to see if they could identify it as Melanie's. Gwen said that she had no doubt in her mind she could identify it immediately. She specifically remembered because she complimented Melanie on it. She thought it was a nice jacket. The ranger told Gwen that he had found the jacket on the trail leading up to the scout camp that Gwen had recommended. Gwen's heart sank because she remembered that night it had gotten so cold that they had had to light their wood-burning stove. The ranger said that he had found it right in the middle of the trail. It was covered in mud and leaves looking like it had been tread upon for weeks, which he said probably had been because she'd been missing for that long. They considered a few possibilities. Maybe she had tied it around her waist. It fell off without her knowing. Maybe it was tied to her backpack and it fell off without her knowing. Or the worst case scenario, maybe something happened to her. Gwen said, sadly, the search only went on for another seven days or so. She recalled that during the entire three weeks that Melanie was missing, it was just pouring the entire time. Gwen stated that she really started feeling so bad about some of the assumptions that they had made in the beginning and that she wished that she would have said something sooner. However, during the entire search for Melanie, she tried to continue on with her daily life. Sometimes she would go out to dinner or meet up with friends for drinks. She said that, of course, the conversation was always the disappearance of Melanie. What could have possibly happened to her? On one of these nights, when she was out with a big group of her friends, they were all drinking, were a little drunk at the time. One of the friends relayed a story that he said had just recently happened in the United Kingdom. He said that a man had killed his wife, then buried her in the backyard and made a concrete patio over top of it. Gwen said, I can assure you that Melanie is not buried in Bill's backyard because coincidentally he was actually building a patio for the landlord for a reduction in rent. She thought nothing of this until a couple days later. A detective called her and asked her if she could stop in after work the next day to talk about Melanie. Gwen thought, oh, maybe they found another clue. Maybe they found Melanie. That was until she got there and she was read her Miranda rights. Gwen said their main question the whole time was, is Bill building a patio on top of dirt or had he poured a concrete slab? She immediately knew that somebody from her group or what she said was a nosy eavesdropper must have contacted the police that they had overheard this conversation they had during that one evening out with drinks. Gwen explained to the detectives that she worked all the time and she had no clue as to what or how he was building the patio. She explained that he started it months ago before Melanie was even around and he's been periodically working on it here and there. She assured the detectives that this was just plain and silly. Bill was not that type of guy but they warned her not to tell them that they had spoken, so she didn't. The following day, while Gwen was on her way to work, she saw at least 10 cop cars, a backhoe, and lots of people standing in front of Bill's patio. She couldn't believe what she was seeing, but they had decided to actually go ahead and dig up his yard. Bill said, quote, See what happens when you help someone who gets lost in your neighbor's backyard? 
They of course found nothing. I guess Bill was absolutely the last person to see Melanie technically that day. Gwen was at work the whole day, but Bill was at his cabin, so of course they questioned him as well. After finding nothing, Pat came over and was just irate with the officers saying that Bill was simply trying to help out a lost person and that she was the one that actually hired him to do the patio. After the detectives finally questioned all of them, the search and basically the investigation for Melanie just died off. There was no more leads. They had no other clues. Frank, the park ranger that was in charge of this investigation, approached Gwen and said that he believed that Melanie most likely went off and died of exposure, gotten lost. It's impossible to say, but he believed that she was most likely not going to be found. He also made several comments, such as the wildlife, like the wild boars and the myriad of hiking trails that she was most likely not familiar with. He said that even with so many people hiking these trails over the years, she's probably not going to be found. Now, the FBI also asked for these case files because roughly six months after she disappeared, there was a serial killer in the area who claimed the lives of a couple of women. He was captured. He never admitted to anything with Melanie Summer, so we don't know. But it's a possibility because the FBI stated that she fit the profile of all his other victims, sadly. According to Gwen, her old rusted car that she got stuck in Pat's backyard is still there over 24 years later and still having no answers to what happened to Melanie. Pat sadly died several months after Melanie's disappearance. She had a stroke and apparently was driving at the time. It was just a tragic accident. Bill, she eventually parted ways with. She doesn't believe he is alive anymore. He had a serious smoking habit with three to four packs a day and he would be in his late 70s and without any contact she doesn't believe him to be alive anymore so Gwen is the last living witness of this whole tragedy she said that the one thing that came out of this was that she has since taken a much more proactive approach to missing hikers the dangers of the areas where she's living been able to give hikers better advice and suggestions and always is looking on the missing list to help if she has any information and she does feel regret that she didn't report Melanie missing earlier because at the time like she reported she just thought she was out hiking and trying to find herself or something like that. Based on the Doe Network and the police department this case is still listed as unsolved. I will have information in the description for the authorities you can contact if you do possibly have any information on where Melanie Ray Summer may be. I want to dedicate this video to Melanie, Bill, Gwen, Pat, everyone that tried to help Melanie and then suffered false accusals and have had to live with that. And I just hope that one day Melanie is found. I want to thank Gwen for sharing this emotional case with me. I want to thank you all for watching. As always, your support, your comments, everything means the world to me. Special thank you to co.ag for providing the background music. Hopefully I'll see you all in the next one. Take care. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me till the end. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday season. If you haven't subscribed, I could please ask you to consider subscribing. It's free and it really, really helps the channel. I appreciate everyone who has subscribed, your feedback, your comments, everything. If you'd like to make a donation, all that information will be in the description. I would definitely like to hear your comments on this case, what you think may have happened. Is it possible that Melanie is still out there? That she just wanted to change her life again, her identity. Who was it that originally reported her missing? Why wouldn't the chiropractor come forward if it was him? Was it the husband that came looking for her? What do you think? I want to say thank you to everyone who submitted pictures for this year's calendar. They should be in soon. Once they are, I'll let everybody know. If you are interested in possibly purchasing one, please let me know in the comments. I've already ordered the first batch, but I want to get an idea of how many more I might need to order. Alright everybody, thanks for watching and see you next time.